So I have the pleasure of um, introducing um, our scientific director of NHGRI. I want to give you a very brief history um, just to sort of set a context. Um, we asked uh, this council's main responsibility is to worry about the extramural side of the institute. Um, but for now 25 years, uh, the institute has had an intramural research program. It is um, under the stewardship, if you will, of in terms of external oversight of something called a board of scientific counselors, which is uh, like all of you, uh, you know, a fully certified whatever you call your advisory roles and, you know, same kind of approval process, et cetera, et cetera. And so they worry about the day-to-day -day and the year-to-year -year aspects of it. But we do like and actually we're asked to make sure that advisory council um, has some familiarity with the extra of the intramural program and so about every couple of years, we asked the scientific director, who's the director of the Division of Intramural Research, to come and just give an update. And so it was time and maybe a few months too late, but we, we decided this was a good council to do this at. And so the other thing I would like to say is uh, in the 25 years of the intramural program, there's been three scientific directors, uh, roughly a third, a third, a third, <laughs> not precise, within a couple of years. Uh, Jeff Trent was the founding scientific director and served um, until 2002. I, I then served before the current position I have as a scientific director. And then when I became director, uh, was one of the first things I did as director was, of course, launch a, a, a search to find my replacement because we needed to have somebody step into that role. And um, it's always, uh, Dan likes to always talk about how on 10-10-10, October 10th of, of 2010 is when he started as a scientific director. He's come and presented a council at least a couple or a few times. Yeah. I can't remember the exact number, uh, but it was time. And so we brought him here to just give you a broad-based uh, overview, update what's going on in the intramural program, and I'm sure I'll be happy to answer any questions you have so you hear about that side of the Institute. So, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you all for having uh, uh, the, the uh, patience to be here uh, listening to what I have to say, even after uh, a fairly uh, lengthy discussion. So in any case, as Eric pointed out, uh, the uh, intramural program of NHGRI is uh, now uh, 25 years old. And uh, just to give you a little bit of background in terms of the intent uh, in establishing an intramural program, uh, the uh, intramural program was uh, founded uh, by Francis uh, Collins back in uh, 1993 uh, when he became the director of what was then uh, the National Center for Human Genome Research, uh, NCHGR. And I think that it was one of his uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, conditions for coming here was that there would be uh, an intramural program uh, in NHGRI. And the vision that he had for the intramural program was somewhat different from the vision he had for the whole institute, which was basically to conduct the Human Genome Project. And so his goals were, first of all, to capitalize on the unique resources of the intramural environment to establish a world-class program in genetics, genomics, and genomic medicine. So this was, from the get-go, uh, oriented more towards the clinical kinds of things uh, than in uh, uh, establishing uh, the sequence of the whole human genome. Uh, the second thing uh, was to catalyze the genomic transformation, if you will, of the intramural programs of, of the other NIH, NIH institutes. And I can tell you, uh, having been here as a part of uh, the uh, Arthritis Institute, that that was something for which there was a great deal of enthusiasm uh, in the intramural program. And then over time, what's happened is that the uh, intramural program has also become somewhat of an incubator uh, for programs that could be uh, exported to the broader genomics community. And in order to sort of jumpstart things and, and get the uh, intramural program up and running uh, relatively quickly, uh, deliberately, uh, the size of the intramural program, at least in terms of its budget, uh, was uh, larger than it is for the intramural programs of other institutes, where the average uh, for other institutes would be on the range of 10 to 15 percent, uh, whereas for NHGRI, it's around 20 percent. So in any case, just to uh, talk a little bit about the distinctive features of intramural NIH uh, so that uh, you can get a sense for what it was that Francis was hoping to capitalize on, uh, and it's sort of uh, apropos of, of the uh, discussion that we've just had, uh, the institutional commitment to researchers over projects. And so uh, essentially the idea what has been uh, for the intramural program of the NIH 
uh, writ large, uh, is that there is this commitment to, to individuals over projects. Second thing uh, is that the review process is different from the review process for extramural uh, investigators in the sense that the review process is, is quadrennial and heavily retrospective. In NHGRI, we have about a 50-50 ratio of, of prospective and retrospective review. But in a lot of the other institutes, in fact, it's more like 70-30 or 80-20 in terms of retrospective to prospective uh, review. Um, it also has the, uh, the feature of uh, more stable funding, perhaps, because of the fact that people aren't on uh, uh, R01 grants, so that people can do longer-term studies that would be difficult to do uh, elsewhere. Uh, and so for that reason, there has been uh, uh, the preference for, and certainly we ask our intramural investigators to, at least to some extent, to embark upon high-risk, high-reward uh, projects that would be difficult to do uh, with R01 funding. And then finally, uh, there are certain specialized resources that we have in the intramural program uh, that uh, people can capitalize on uh, in their research. Probably the one that is uh, paramount among the specialized resources is this that is pictured here, and that's the clinical center of the NIH. Uh, it's basically a 230-bed uh, research hospital in which all of the patients uh, are admitted on a protocol, and where there is no cost uh, either to the patient or to the investigator uh, for being admitted to the hospital. And so this is something that should be, anyway, a great incentive for people to do uh, clinical research and in the context of NHGRI uh, to really uh, uh, embark upon genomic medicine uh, type projects. So in any case, just a little bit about the uh, NHGRI uh, intramural program. Currently, we have 22 uh, tenured senior investigators, and it's a fairly distinguished group. Uh, five of them are in the National Academy of Medicine, two of them in the National Academy of Sciences. We have currently three tenure-track investigators, so we're a little bit uh, right now uh, short in terms of tenure-track investigators. Part of that has been because we have had some budgetary issues over the last uh, several years. Uh, we also have three senior scientists who are uh, non-tenure track investigators who are still very uh, senior in terms of their uh, standing in their respective fields. And then we have 13 associate investigators. These are individuals that are sort of like uh, research uh, uh, faculty, uh, either uh, research uh, laboratory faculty or research clinical faculty. And then nine adjunct investigators who have their primary uh, appointment uh, in other institutes. We also have a number of cores, which are very strong cores uh, in the intramural program that makes it so that people don't necessarily have to have huge labs uh, in order to conduct uh, the work that they do. Uh, we have a sequencing center, uh, which is really uh, outstanding. It's sort of a medium-sized sequen sequencing center uh, that has uh, uh, really some of the uh, latest technology in terms of, of both uh, uh, production sequencing and in terms of research uh, level sequencing. Our total staff is about 540 individuals, at least right now, uh, and uh, our appropriated budget is around $114 million. And currently, uh, the intramural program is, is uh, spread amongst uh, seven buildings on campus, uh, plus we have off-campus facilities both in Rockville uh, and in Baltimore. The intramural program is also uh, distinctive in the sense that it is the home uh, to uh, at least some of the leadership uh, of the NIH, uh, and uh, the NHGRI intramural program has been uh, really a haven for a number of uh, institute directors uh, and NIH directors over uh, the course of the last uh, several years. Uh, and in the past, uh, Harold Varmus, uh, who was first the director of the NIH, and then the director of the Cancer Institute, uh, who was uh, uh, also uh, housed in the uh, NHGRI, uh, and then Betsy Nabel, uh, a, a past uh, director of, of NHLBI. So in any case, going back to my own uh, history, 
uh, in the Institute. Uh, uh, actually, before I became a member of the Institute, I was a tenure track investigator in the Arthritis Institute. And really, uh, it was something that had a catalytic effect on my own career, uh, the uh, uh, advent of, of the NHGRI intramural program uh, at the NIH in the sense that really it brought uh, the tools of genetics and genomics to several of us in the intramural program who were doing various positional cloning projects at the time. So back in 1993, we had mapped the gene for familial Mediterranean fever, uh, but at that point had, had not yet uh, identified the gene, and so having really uh, a group of people who had expertise in uh, various areas of, of uh, mapping and, and uh, transcript identification and, and uh, other uh, uh, parts of the uh, effort of finding a disease gene actually was extremely important both to us and to other investigators in different institutes as well. And so that led in 1997 to our finding the gene and then sort of to flip it uh, the other way around in terms of then utilizing some of the tools of, of the, uh, uh, the special tools of the intramural program of the NIH, we then established a clinic uh, in which we have so far uh, seen over 2,000 patients uh, with various disorders that in some cases it's FMF, uh, but in other cases it's other inflammatory conditions other than FMF. And so this has really uh, been something that has, has been catalytic uh, for us. Uh, this is just a table from a, uh, a review that one of my fellows wrote uh, last year, just uh, itemizing uh, the list of diseases that we now recognize, starting from FMF as, as the beginning point. And about half of them, uh, the genes were discovered here uh, at the NIH, and the other half have been identified elsewhere. So it really has been uh, something that, that has had an impact uh, across uh, the scientific community. We've also used some of these tools to be able to discover new treatments for patients. In one case, uh, a disease that, that we discovered uh, back, discovered the cause of back in the early, early 2000s, a disease called NOMID, neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease. Patients have recurrent fevers uh, and have chronic aseptic meningitis, uh, which usually leads to severe intellectual disability uh, in these patients over time. Because we had found that, that mutations in NLRP3, uh, which is a gene that regulates IL-1, uh, were important uh, in this disease. Uh, we started a trial of anakinra, the IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, in patients uh, with this condition, in 18 patients with this condition. And it really is sort of a vindication of genomic medicine in terms of, of the fact that uh, it is like flipping a light switch in terms of the clinical manifestations of these patients. And in fact, um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw one of the patients who was a part of this protocol. Uh, whereas the natural history, as I said, is usually severe intellectual disability, he had just finished his freshman year in college in biochemistry. Um, another uh, example, uh, a disease that we discovered back uh, in 2014, or published back in 2014, actually a disease where patients were referred to us because they were thought to have NOMAD, but actually they had strokes rather than aseptic meningitis, it turns out to be caused by mutations in adenosine deaminase type 2, and um, these patients have strokes on the order of one every four years or something like that. Uh, and based on some of the findings that we had made with regard to uh, the biology of this condition, we thought that perhaps treating them with inhibitors of tumor necrosis factor uh, would be uh, a reasonable thing to try. Before TNF uh, inhibitors, in a group of 15 patients, there were 55 strokes over the course of 2,000 or so patient months. Since being on TNF inhibitors, these 15 patients, we've observed for about 600 patient months, and the number of strokes is zero. Uh, so in any case, again, is something where using the clinical center, one can have a big impact in terms of, of uh, human disease. 
And then finally, a, a case that we're involved in uh, uh, more recently, uh, is a kid, 14-year-old boy uh, from Bangalore, uh, India, who was referred to us with recurrent fevers, with peritonitis, uh, with uh, polyarthritis, uh, and colitis. And it turns out uh, that by exome analysis, he has a mutation in a gene that's involved in regulating ubiquitination. And it also turns out uh, that there is a, a naturally occurring mouse knockout of that gene, uh, where if you cross it with a, uh, a TNF knockout, uh, essentially all of the clinical findings go away. So we brought this patient uh, to the NIH. This, these are just some images. He was in a wheelchair uh, at the time that uh, he came to us a few months ago. So we put him on a TNF inhibitor. And here is a picture of him now, standing, as you can see. And I don't think that the uh, audio on this, uh, uh, on this uh, particular clip uh, works, but if it did, you'd hear some music, and you would see that he is now dancing a few months after going on uh, TNF inhibitors. So really, this is something where using the clinical center has a huge impact in terms of, of uh, both understanding the biology of human diseases and having an impact in terms of, of treatment. There are many, many other examples of this sort of thing going on in our intramural program. Here's uh, Ellen Sadransky, uh, one of our tenured senior investigators, uh, who has been a student of Gaucher disease for a number of years. And she noticed uh, that occasionally, in some of her patients with Gaucher disease, uh, that Parkinsonism uh, developed. And what's more, that Parkinson's disease uh, was seen at least in a few of the relatives of people with, uh, uh, with Gaucher disease. And so actually she did a large study, which is summarized uh, in this New England Journal article shown here, basically demonstrating that mutations in glucocerebrosidase, the cause of Gaucher disease, can also lead to Parkinson's disease. And in fact, uh, this is now known as the most common uh, genetic risk factor for Parkinson's disease and related disorders. What's more, uh, Ellen has used uh, NCATS, the Chemical Genomics uh, Center, uh, which is housed here on campus, and certainly it's another of the uh, resources that people in the intramural program have uh, uh, at their disposal, uh, to develop a small molecule that actually can uh, inhibit uh, the biologic process in Gaucher disease. and they're also now uh, uh, testing this in uh, iPSCs uh, in dopaminergic uh, neurons uh, in Parkinson's disease. And so this is, uh, this is another example of uh, using uh, the clinical center to, uh, to good end. Philip Shaw uh, is one of our uh, tenure track investigators uh, in the social and behavioral research branch uh, who's a child psychiatrist and an expert on ADHD. And so he's used the clinical center to basically scan a cohort of kids uh, with ADHD in the same scanner, the same MRI scanner, for the last 14 years. A real feat just to get uh, a couple hundred kids with ADHD to stay still in a scanner uh, every year for 14 years in a row. Uh, but basically, Philip has identified now, rather than just using clinical phenotype uh, as the um, uh, hallmark of ADHD has actually found that there are differences in the way the brain is wired that are heritable uh, that one can uh, look at uh, in ADHD. And this slide just uh, demonstrates that in kids who actually remit, because there are some uh, kids with ADHD who eventually remit, they have a connectome, a wiring of the brain that is similar to individuals who have never been affected, whereas those who have ADHD persisting into adulthood have a wiring of the, uh, of the brain that remains uh, abnormal. Another of the people who have uh, really uh, capitalized on the clinical center is Les uh, Biesecker. Uh, who has uh, been a student of Proteus syndrome and other overgrowth syndromes for many years. Uh, and uh, uh, 
through those studies, through the careful study of patients with those diseases, eventually uh, made the paradigm shifting uh, discovery uh, that in fact uh, patients with Proteus syndrome uh, have somatic mutations uh, in the tissue, a, a non-malignant disease uh, with uh, somatic mutations. Less has, of course, done a number of other things of, of great note, uh, such as uh, his leadership in uh, the return of secondary findings uh, in uh, research protocols. And of late, uh, he has developed a, a project with Richard Siegel in my old institute, the Arthritis Institute, uh, the genome uh, ascertainment cohort, uh, in which there are a bunch of uh, patients, about 1,000 patients, who have undergone uh, genomic sequencing, uh, where uh, uh, essentially investigators in the intramural program can query those individuals, uh, the sequences of those individuals, for mutations in their gene of interest, and the patients are consented for callback, uh, so that then deep phenotyping of those patients uh, can be done. Bill Gall, I think you're very familiar with Bill's work uh, and the impact that it has had uh, broadly. The Undiagnosed Diseases Program just uh, turned 10, uh, actually uh, about a week ago, uh, and has had a number of, of milestones. And of course, it has been a case where the intramural program has been a proving ground, if you will, uh, for something that then has been exported uh, to the extramural community, and of course, starting at the NIH, the UDP, uh, whoops, um, but uh, uh, now, of course, we have a number of centers uh, as part of the uh, Undiagnosed uh, Diseases Network. Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, uh, National uh, Chemical Genomics Center uh, was a part of the NIHGRI intramural program up until uh, the first year that I was the scientific director. It's now a part of NCATS and is something that is broadly available for investigators uh, uh, in the extramural world. Larry Brody, uh, another of our intramural uh, investigators, uh, has been the leader of CIDR, uh, the Center for Inherited Disease Research, uh, which has certainly had a huge impact in terms of both sequencing and genotyping uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, Charles Rotimi. Uh, uh, the head of our uh, Center for Research in uh, Genomics and Global Health has certainly had a, a big impact in terms of uh, health uh, disparities research and uh, uh, the study of, of uh, African ancestry populations uh, in genomics. And Max Munka, uh, another of our investigators, has now, uh, in the same vein, uh, started a training program in which uh, individuals from all over the world uh, come for a month-long uh, training program uh, in uh, genomics and genetics. The social and behavioral research branch uh, has been sort of a pioneer in the sense that it is the first uh, branch uh, in the intramural program uh, for social and behavioral research in any of the institutes at the NIH. Julie Segre, I think you heard uh, in Eric's summary this morning. Uh, that Julie uh, uh, has a paper that's just come out with regard to uh, uh, detecting various uh, flora uh, in the, uh, the plumbing of the clinical center hospital, and really that's something that is very difficult to do uh, in, a, uh, in a hospital, particularly in a hospital that may be concerned about uh, uh, lawsuits and, and uh, that sort of thing. And so certainly the, the clinical center has taken the lead in terms of, of those kinds of, of studies. Uh, Jim Mulliken, uh, the head of our sequencing center, uh, has uh, been a pioneer not only in running the sequencing center, but in various collaborative studies with the Vaccine Research Center on anti-HIV antibodies. Adam Philippi, another of our uh, tenure track investigators. Uh, has uh, uh, taken the lead with regard to uh, developing new algorithms for uh, assembling uh, sequence from, from long read uh, single molecule uh, sequencers and has had a, a big impact in that uh, regard. Uh, Sean Burgess, one of our zebrafish aficionados, uh, has uh, uh, developed a, uh, a line, an HGRI1, of zebrafish. Uh, for CRISPR-Cas9 uh, modification so that, that there's a standardized 
uh, zebrafish line for doing this, and has developed a tool uh, that one can search on the web, uh, basically, for designing uh, guide RNAs uh, for, uh, for developing uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, modification of the zebrafish genome. And then, uh, I'm almost done with the litany here, but uh, Elaine Ostrander certainly has taken the lead in terms of canine uh, genomics, and um, Dave Bodine has uh, generated a resource for people who are interested in um, uh, the epigenetics of, of uh, erythroid development uh, in the mouse. So in any case, there's a lot of examples. These are just a few, uh, and certainly uh, the faculty of the NHGRI has been very, very engaged in terms of developing tools for the broader community. And, and in the process doing things that uh, advance their own careers as well. Uh, just uh, in the last couple of years, summarizing at least some of the, um, uh, the papers that have come out from the intramural program, you can see that really there's, there's a, uh, a long list of papers published in very uh, prominent journals. And certainly uh, there's a number of others besides the ones that are, are listed here. In terms of the review of the uh, intramural program, Eric talked about the Board of Scientific Counselors, and I'll mention that in a little bit, too. But we also have a decennial, and every 10-year, uh, review of the intramural program uh, by a blue ribbon panel. And we had our last blue ribbon panel review uh, back in 2011 and 2012. It was chaired uh, by David Page, uh, and other members were Wiley Burke, Nancy Cox, Bruce Korf. Rick Myers, Bob Waterston, and Huda Zogby. Uh, and uh, they uh, both uh, site visited the intramural program, but also reviewed a lot of uh, written materials as well, and uh, had very positive things to say about the intramural program uh, with regard to its scientific productivity, mentoring and training programs, dissemination of genomic technologies across the uh, intramural research program, uh, internationally recognized research faculty, robust uh, research infrastructure, and collaboration and collegiality. What they did recommend was, number one, uh, to continue to adhere to the model of investigator-initiated research, again, coming back to that theme from uh, the previous discussion, uh, allocate resources based on rigorous reviews by the Board of Scientific Counselors, uh, embrace a risk-taking culture, uh, insist on excellence, uh, and continue to be a change agent uh, on the NIH campus and beyond. Uh, and in terms of the day-to-day uh, -day evaluation of things, the Board of Scientific Counselors currently is made up of nine uh, extramural uh, experts. Brendan Lee uh, is the chair, and you can see the other people who are currently serving on the board. It's a rotating uh, service. Um, and uh, each investigator is reviewed uh, every four years. It's a quadrennial review process. Uh, what I ask uh, the board, uh, the site visitors, to do is to uh, address these questions with regard to investigators. Does the work fundamentally change the way that we think about or understand relevant areas of biomedical science? Through the development of new methods, does it change the way that we do science? Uh, for clinical research? Does it change the way that we practice medicine? Uh, certainly the deletion test, whether clinical or basic, how would the field look if the intramural investigator had not been active for the last five years? And then finally, is the research worth studying with the special resources of the intramural program? Um, to date, uh, we've, we've been using a uh, relative rating system uh, for the last several years, and to date, uh, we have 60 evaluations uh, that have been done. Some people have been evaluated more than once uh, with this system. And 63 percent of, of the uh, investigators have, have received uh, the highest rating uh, of outstanding. In terms of planning for the, uh, the next century, uh, uh, next quarter century anyway, uh, but maybe the next century too, uh, uh, we certainly want to uh, maintain a strong commitment to to the, uh, the things that I've uh, already mentioned, risk-taking, scientific excellence, and uh, leading genomics uh, uh, in the NIH, a merit-based resource allocation, 
uh, strategic tenure track faculty recruitment because of the fact that we don't have a top-down system in which I or anyone else tells investigators what they should be doing for their research. If we want to shape uh, the uh, intramural program, then we do it basically through our recruitments. And so if we want to have a more uh, bioinformatic oriented or basic science oriented or what have you uh, faculty, then we do that uh, uh, through the process of recruitment. Uh, certainly succession planning is something that we do have to think about. About a third of our investigators are now at the point where they at least could uh, retire sometime in the next five years, and so we do have to think about uh, uh, those issues. And then uh, engagement uh, in an in institute-wide strategic planning process, which Eric has already, I know, talked about a lot, uh, and a new round of Blue Ribbon Panel Review, uh, which will be uh, upcoming probably uh, in 2020 or so, uh, that we would start that process as well. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the overview. I guess I did go exactly half an hour. So uh, in any case, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, uh, if you do. Yeah, Trey. Yeah, thanks for the really informative update. Um, with regard to the, the extra budget bolus that was um, sent the NHGRI's way this year, I think Terry might have said a few words about intramural, extramural this, uh, this morning, but could you comment, um, did you guys benefit from, from a few extra dollars this year, and how did you, or how do you plan to use them? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So, um, as, I mean, we can break it down into, uh, you know, sort of the overall uh, gains for the NIH, for NHGRI, and for the intramural program. So NIH, as you may know, uh, got an 8.8 percent uh, increase in its budget. Some of that uh, money was earmarked for particular projects uh, like the cancer moonshot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that NHGRI, I think, got about a 5 percent uh, overall increase. Eric and I have talked about the idea that probably uh, the intramural program being at 20 percent, that that's higher than what it would be nice uh, for us to be. But if you do the thought experiment in terms of how you would fix that, so if, if the institute were to get a 5 percent increase this year, which it did, and the intramural program didn't get any increase at all, uh, then we would go from 20 percent to 19 percent. And if we wanted to get down to 10 percent, you know, which is, you know, sort of the, the goal uh, in a lot of uh, institutes, so it would take us 10 years of the intramural program not growing at all, uh, and, the, extra, and the, the rest of the institute growing uh, at 5 percent a year in order to redress that. So basically, that would be very hard to do. Eric and I talked about the idea of building a 3 percent increase into the base of the intramural program so that the intramural program would grow by $3 million, uh, and actually uh, uh, this year, but it's not something that's a, a long-standing commitment, we did get an extra $2 million as well, uh, so that we actually have grown by 5 percent this year, the same as, as the average for the institute. But the commitment would only be 3 percent, you know, for uh, out years. In terms of what have we done with it? Well, you know, there, there has been uh, a lot of scrimping on things because of the fact that we went through a period of time where there was sequestration uh, and then a flat budget. And so actually there's a, a number of, of uh, uh, pieces of equipment, capital equipment, that have sort of gotten old uh, and needed to be replaced. And so uh, we've spent a fair amount of money on that. Uh, we are recruiting uh, a new investigator and, and actually we're sort of close to uh, having a deal uh, with him, and, and we're excited about the, the possibility of recruiting uh, other uh, tenure track investigators in the next two or three years. Certainly, uh, you know, we have to have some balance, you know, with regard to, on the one hand, uh, because genomics is a technologically driven field, we have to stay up to date in terms of technology, but on the other hand, uh, we certainly do need to have uh, smart young people with energy and ideas as well, especially as, as the faculty grade. Okay, sorry. Other questions for Dan? 
Steve, go ahead. I was just curious, how did you, when you were talking about the, um, the adenine deaminase and then Adenosine deaminase, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and then, and then you jump to that to anti-TNF. Uh, how, yeah, how did how did we yeah. make that connection? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a very good question, and and certainly, it's not something that's sort of an obvious um, uh, uh, this than that kind of uh, conclusion. So, um, it was really sort of a fortuitous thing. Uh, the um, uh, patients came to us, a lot of them having already been treated with a lot of different things: high doses of steroids, cytoxan. Uh, uh, IL-1 inhibitors, et cetera, uh, and had not responded uh, to them. It just happened on skin biopsies that several of the patients had perivascular TNF. And so we thought, well, maybe TNF inhibition would be uh, a worthwhile thing to do. And as I mentioned, I mean, these kids have strokes, you know, like every four years or something like that. And there are patients. I mean, they, they do come. They see us. We continue to follow them. And so it's, it's, you know, sort of like, um, you know, sitting under the sword of Damocles or whatever, you know, uh, to be taking care of these kids. And so we, you know, it was just a try, and it turned out that it was fairly successful. But there's no, there's no real connection to the mutations of ADA? Or? Uh, not that we know of, yeah. at least as of yet. Well, Dan, thank you for coming and, and uh, giving the presentation to the council. We're grateful for your time. So we have more of the open session, but I think we need a break. Uh, run upstairs and get your caffeine boost, and try to be back at uh, 3.40, please. We'll resume then. <laughs>